everyone. My name is Peter Levine. I'm from Tufts University, although I'm also a visiting fellow at the SNF Agora Institute this semester. And welcome to an SNF Agora conversation, first in a series. Um, a word about the Institute. Um, it's an academic center and public forum dedicated to improving and expanding civic engagement and informed and inclusive dialogue as the corner of a global democracy or a cornerstone of global democracy in general. Um, and over the next six weeks, which is how many weeks are left to the US election, we'll be having um, a series of conversations that will consider the specific current threats to American democracy, including misinformation and disinformation, insecure voting and, and systems for voting, um, and polarization that's particularly exacerbated by issues of race. And all through these conversations, we'll also look at the path forward, considering things like youth voter engagement, um, how to push back against rising populism um, and social movements that are building bridges. So this is just the first in a series of conversations, but a good one because to start with because of the very title. So I'm delighted to be joined today by professors Robert Lieberman and Suzanne Mettler, and we'll be kicking off this discussion, this webcast series with a discussion of their new book, Four Threats, uh, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy. Four Threats, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy. Um, Robert Lieberman is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Political Science at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he studies American political development, race, and American politics and public policy. And we've gotten to know each other through some extracurricular activities, which have been very fun. Um, and Suzanne Mettler is the John L. Senior Professor of American Institutions in the Department of Government at Cornell University. She studies and teaches American politics and public policy. Thanks, thanks very much to both of you for joining me. And the way this is going to work is we're going to have about 30 minutes of conversation. No, no presentation, but I'm going to ask some questions to elucidate uh, the themes of the book. And um, then about half past 12, we'll start taking questions that others submit as well. Um, and just before I, I, I have a first question, um, but just before we go to that, I want to say I enjoyed the book very much and recommend it. And you should all read it. It's extremely readable because it's mostly narrative. It, it, uh, tells a bunch of stories and they are, even though you know American history probably if you're joining this call, they are suspenseful stories. Um, background noise, something coming from me. That's me, sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, so one way to read the book is that it makes us realize, makes me realize that we are, um, we have, our, our Republic has hung by a thread on a number of occasions. It has been, we've had a a bunch of really close calls. And uh, so to tell those stories, the authors, they, they tell a lot of, of concrete uh, stories with characters and events, uh, including very famous characters like, you know, Abe Lincoln, but also some people I didn't know about. And uh, they make it very dramatic. And it's not um, just anecdotal in a bad sense, like it's not uh, uh, quaint, uh, colorful stories to, to turn the pages. It's, it's pretty dramatic. So I actually found it hard to put down. I also found it very sobering. And I hope that part of our conversation can be about uh, reasons for hope, because those are not as prominent in the book, but we can get to that. <laughs> so uh, we're going to, it's called Four Threats to American Democracy. So the first question is, what are the four threats? And, and uh, I think Robert was going to talk about that briefly. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And thanks to SNF Agora for uh, convening these really important conversations. Um, we're pleased to be here. So the frame of the book um, comes from uh, what we've learned from um, people who study democracy and countries outside the United States. As Peter said, both Suzanne and I uh, make a living um, studying and teaching about American politics. Um, and we find ourselves in a situation where American democracy is vulnerable and threatened in a way that we, the, those of us who spend our time thinking about the United States, haven't really considered before. And so we look to other countries to to try and understand what it is that makes democracy fragile. And what we find is there are four conditions that threaten democracy in general. Um, and I'll tick those off and then say a word or two about each one. They are political polarization, what we call conflict over membership in, in society, um, high and rising economic inequality, and the fourth is uh, the growth of executive power. Um, so let me just say a word or two about each one before we go on. Political polarization um, is the sort of division of society into these us versus them camps. Democracy works particularly well 
when there are lots of different groups and identities in society and, and people have overlapping or what political scientists call cross-cutting affiliations. What's really problematic is when these differences increasingly align with each other and people start sorting themselves out into two mutually antagonistic us and them camps. And then politics ceases to be a process of sort of um, negotiation and mutual accommodation. And it becomes more like mortal combat in which your political opponents become your enemies and the goal is to vanquish them at all costs. So that's polarization. Um, second is conflict over the boundaries of the political community. Again, democracy works best when everyone agrees who's a member of society um, and that everyone has equal status. Unresolved rifts in um, particularly formative rifts, conflicts that date back to the founding of the nation and or even earlier over who's included in that uh, society can emerge and reemerge again and again as a source of trouble. In the United States, that has often um, taken the form of conflict over uh, race and particularly immigration, um, uh, or, or race particularly, but also immigration. And in our stories um, of democratic fragility, battles over race really take uh, center stage, especially um, over the status of African Americans. Um, the third is rising economic inequality. Places where economic inequality is high and where inequality is growing, <clears throat> excuse me, are more likely to suffer democratic deterioration. Um, that's generally not because of the risk that the um, lower classes, that the poor uh, citizens will rise up, but that the affluent uh, will become wary, that the masses will impose redistributive policies, um, and, and that the the wealthy will band together to protect their interests and they'll support repressive measures, um, sort of do whatever it takes to preserve their privileges and their status, you know, democracy be damned. Um, and the fourth uh, threat is what we call executive aggrandizement, the enlargement and concentration of uh, power in the nation's top leader and the demise of checks and balances. These, this kinds of shift, which we've seen particularly over the last century or so, um, makes a country more prone to uh, to uh, uh, autocracy. Uh, thanks, thanks, Robert. That was nicely concise and very well done. So, and what he's done is actually shown everyone um, the uh, or described the four columns of this of this table, which is from the book. But the rows are the different critical moments in American history when these. Um, these, these threats have, have risen particularly acutely. So Suzanne, would you like to talk to us a little bit about the, the rows, in other words, these moments of, uh, of severe threat? Yes, thank you. And let me just say, first of all, thank you so much uh, to the Agora Institute for hosting us today. We're delighted to be here. And it's wonderful to have the chance to have this conversation with you, Peter. Um, so, what our table illustrates here, um, we've, you know, we picked out these five periods and a contemporary period to study. Um, we knew that these are periods when, um, from the historical record, we know that lots of Americans were concerned that democracy as they knew it at that point in time was in danger of backsliding or deteriorating, that the country might, um, might risk democratic instability and instead of becoming uh, democracy becoming more robust that, um, that it might go in the other direction. And what was very striking to us in writing the book was to realize that, well, you know, I think many Americans today have the impression that democracy is secure in the United States. We have the world's oldest constitution uh, with its checks and balances. So, you know, we've been through a lot of tough times before and the, the country has survived. Uh, and then on top of that, we think of democracy as having a progressive arc that while it was, uh, the country was very undemocratic in many ways in, uh, at its, uh, in its beginnings, that it's become more democratic, particularly since the 1960s and 1970s and uh, the, the achievements of the civil rights uh, era um, that you know, all Americans really became included as full citizens. So it seems hard to imagine that we could encounter backsliding. But when you look at American history, in fact, democracy has been really fragile and time and again, 
there have been uh, real concerns of backsliding. And what we find is that when even just one of the threats that Rob just mentioned was present in the 1790s, uh, polarization was strong, um, the nation almost didn't make it through its first decade. Um, the, uh, it was just an, an era of accelerating polarization over time, um, culminating in the election of 1800, which many feared was going to lead to the restoration of monarchy or to civil war and secession. Uh, we made it through that, but then we get to the 1850s and three threats uh, come into confluence together. And it led to the civil war. Um, and then in the 1890s, the confluence of three threats led to the disenfranchisement of millions of African American men who had been then for decades practicing their new voting rights and running for office at all levels in the South. Um, they lost these rights uh, in, uh, during the 1890s. And once civil rights, once their voting rights were lost and they lost political power, then Jim Crow becomes established and people lost their civil liberties and civil rights as well. And it lasted 60 years. So major backsliding has been known to happen in the United States. Now, uh, if right now, uh, for the first time ever in American history, all four threats have come together in a confluence. And they are interacting with each other in ways that make them particularly dangerous and combustible. So we think that this is a, a time when we have to be very concerned about what we call the pillars of democracy. Thanks, Suzanne. I can put the slide up later if we need it again. Um, I think one of the sobering stories of your book is that this is the first time we've had all four. The other one um, is perhaps the fact that we've gotten out of polarization before, but we've gotten out of it at the expense of the least advantaged, um, in particularly people of African descent always. So, but also others sometimes with them. So and I, I was drawing that conclusion already as I read, and then you bring it out at, towards the end of the book very explicitly that, that the solution to polarization has been kind of elite consensus at the expense of somebody. Um, but it's always included black people. So is that, am I reading it right? And, and if, if I am, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating, and if I am, tell me. But um, the, the 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 other question would be: Does it have to be this way again, or can we? Is this written into our DNA in some way, or can we do a better job? Yeah, I think you're absolutely reading it right. And we found this um, for us. This was one of the really sobering observations about the these recurring crises: is that the the settlement or resolution of this of these democratic crises has often resolved around a compromise of democratic value, values that really entails um, perpetuating or even deepening racial hierarchy and exclusion. So, you know, Suzanne mentioned the 1790s, that was um, in a sense resolved that conflict between Federalists and, and Democratic Republicans um, was in a sense resolved by the election of 1800, which resulted in a tie. Um, we've all seen the musical, so we know how it comes out. Um, um, and Jefferson was elected president, and there was a, a peaceful transfer of power, something that's on everyone's mind these days, um, between John Adams and, and Jefferson. Um, that itself was enabled by the three-fifths clause of the Constitution, which gave the slaveholding white South uh, a disproportionate amount of power in, in the national government. Um, um, I, again, in the 1890s, um, there was this confluence of three threats, as Suzanne just described. Um, and uh, we tell in the book a really harrowing series of stories about the 1890s, in, um, uh, particularly in North Carolina, where um, there was essentially in the city of Wilmington a coup in which a white supremacist uh, Democratic Party aligned mob of, of sort of militias um, overthrew an elected government of uh, Republicans and populists that was a biracial coalition um, and uh, that set off the, a cascade of, of white supremacy and voter suppression and uh, Jim Crow that lasted for, um, for 60 years. So um, it's a recurring pattern. Um, you know, putting, to put it bluntly, um, We've often preserved a version of democracy for ourselves, for those who are already inside the club, for white Americans in particular, by restricting who's included under the umbrella of democracy. 
Um, you know, and I think uh, that's the enduring challenge of American democracy is how to create a, 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 a true multiracial democracy. We may we may push you on you know what to do next uh, towards the end, but but there's one other um, thing that I found sobering. There's a lot that's worrying in the book, but uh, one other major theme was that a couple of times we've been saved because um, well placed leaders have actually exercised some restraint. 1800 being an example, or Lincoln at the end of the Civil War. Um, so are we dependent on? I mean, is the only solution here that the key players actually behave pretty decently? because there's not a very strong reason to think that will happen in 2020. Yeah, you know, um, this idea of, of leaders exercising restraint, <clears throat> I think it's less a matter of, you know, do we have individuals who happen to um, be upstanding and well-mannered civil types, and more a matter of the political context in which they're governing. Um, so, um, you know, if, if I look for one of these periods of time where there's really a success story in how a crisis to democracy is handled, it's actually Watergate. Right. So on Watergate, you have, um, you know, President Nixon and the White House are really violating, or they're, they're really harming the pillars of democracy in several respects. But at that point in time, members of Congress in both parties and both chambers um, and uh, the judiciary, and as well, you know, outside of the political institutions, uh, members of the press, really all came through and played their roles to restrain uh, the president. So, you know, power politics is always at play in these moments. And in that instance, um, Nixon was restrained, the, the, the person who was really, you know, creating these problems was restrained by the other actors in the system, even members of his own party. Um, and after the, the crisis was over, there were major reforms that were enacted, um, again, with bipartisan support in Congress. However, we can't just, you know, look to that for, um, for much help right now, because that was a very different moment. There was one threat that was um, looming large right then. It was executive aggrandizement and the way it was being used by a president who would direct executive power to his own personal and political gain. But the political parties were not polarized the way they are now. They were both internally divided um, and they both con contained liberals and conservatives. So you didn't get the same political dynamic that we have here. And um, the, the other threats were, were not as prevalent either at that point in time. So now, you know, you have, for example, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who, um, you know, used um, some logic uh, four years ago for why he was not going to move forward with um, the Merrick Garland nomination for President Obama, and now seems to be <laughs> finding some new logic for why he is going ahead in an election year with um, a nomination that comes from President Trump. Um, you know, that's not respecting these democratic norms, but um, we're in this era of high polarization, so it's not at all um, surprising that McConnell would do exactly that. Um, and so it's the political context that really matters more than the individual. Maybe we could build on that, that thread about, um, yeah, about the hyperpartisanship in, in the Congress right at this moment. Um, and, and I'll ask you the question about what, 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 what should be done to reduce the, or whether, whether anything should be done to reduce the temperature. So imagine that, um, and this is just a hypothetical situation, we don't know what's gonna actually happen, but imagine that Republicans do follow through and ram through a Supreme Court nomination very quickly. And um, Donald Trump does try to cast a lot of doubt on the legitimacy of the election, but, he, but Joe Biden does get sworn in. So now you have, you have conditions of very, very high polarization, but you do have uh, the political defeat of, of one of the actors. So Biden's now in, in the, pre the presidency. Do, so is your advice then that you should do, that he should do things like sort of try to lower the temperature of part and, and accept the legitimacy of, of, of the strategies taken by the other party? Or should he do something like try to expand the size of the Supreme Court and, uh, you know, add um, uh, DC and Puerto Rico as two new Senate seats? And is it, so is that upping the ante and playing badly? Or is that the right thing to do in a situation where the, where the, the, the structure is basically polarized. Let me. Well, that's a that's a that's a great question, and I don't think um, I think you know a lot of people are going to be pondering that over the next weeks and months. But um, 
let me just back up a little bit and describe what, what we think is, is really the most productive way for people to think about this moment. Um, these threats that we've outlined, polarization, um, um, in economic inequality, and, and so forth, are, are very hard to confront and deal with themselves. Um, you know, polarization comes and goes, but it's, it's, a very, it's a really steep challenge for us to think about how we can, what we can do to reduce polarization. What we think is most productive is to focus on what we call the four pillars of democracy. These are the things that, um, the things that make democracy work, these sort of essential features of a democratic system. I mean, these are free and fair elections, the idea that um, we have elections that are decisive, that actually confer power, and in which um, citizens have a wide and equal opportunity to participate and everyone's vote is counted equally. Um, uh, a second is um, the idea of a, a legitimate opposition. Um, that is the idea that you and I can disagree about policy or about the future of the country without becoming um, um, enemies. Um, uh, what's the third? I, I, like I should be able to say because yeah, I just rule, of law. rule of law. Yes, I always forget. I always forget one. It's, it's, really right. it's rule of law. And it's it's right. a different one. I forget. Going uh, around these days, people forgetting yeah, right. about the rule of law. Exactly. Um, the third is the rule of law. Um, the idea that the law treats everyone equally and that be, how, be, being in power doesn't exempt you from the law. And the fourth is what we call the integrity of rights, the protection and of, of the rights that are necessary to make democratic governance work, particularly voting rights um, and civil rights and civil liberties. So I think the focus should be on these things and, 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 and we should demand, we should expect and demand that our elected officials um, act to protect these things. Um, so one of, the, one of the particularly alarming things about this moment is that all of these pillars seem to be crumbling right now and under some threat. So the question about what, uh, you know, hypothetical President Biden um, and the Democratic majority um, should do, um, I mean, there are a number of ways to answer that question. One is to say, well, just because the Republicans who have been in power for the last four years have been acting badly and dangerously with respect to these pillars um, and have been engaging in what some scholars call constitutional hardball, um, doesn't mean that the other side should also engage in constitutional hardball, especially when I think it's fair to say that the Democratic Party now is the party that seems to be adhering more uh, closely to these pillars of democracy. Um, so, you know, just because they did it doesn't mean we should do it too, is one answer. On the other hand, you could say that, um, um, that these kinds of moves that you're describing, adding uh, new states or changing the structure of the court, um, are correctives, are sort of pro-democracy correctives right. to harmful things that have happened um, in the last few years. You know, we have this system that promotes um, uh, sort of, you know, ma minority rule under these conditions. Um, the Senate is unequal, the Electoral College um, is unequal. Um, so, you know, recalibrating in the way you describe might be seen as a sort of pro-democracy move. Um, but it wouldn't be seen that way unanimously, right? Republicans would look at that and say, uh, well, they're just uh, seizing an advantage the way we did. So uh, these are very difficult uh, situations to get out of. The chapter, I think, in your book that um, is most pertinent to this is the, is the FDR chapter. And, and we actually have a question in the chat about, about the 1930s as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll use that as a um, springboard. I mean, the, um, it occurs, so it's very much worth reading because in part the, the fight over um, what we call court packing, his effort to expand the Supreme Court is, is, a, is a piece of that story. And broadly, you're putting him in the category of a, 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 an executive branch aggrandizer, although you, you, it's a nuanced portrait, but that's the problem. That's the problem in that threat. But I, I think it's, I, I was very torn about it because the other way to read it would be exactly that he was, um, he was in fact defend, expanding the the democracy, in part by building a much bigger government, but that was in, in response to popular opinion about the need to have a social welfare state. Um, and likewise, the battle over expanding the Supreme Court was a battle with an extremely reactionary judiciary. 
so I just what what say more about the FDR case and a little bit more. I mean, is he a villain too, or is he? And 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 it, the reason the relevance is the que the question I asked a minute ago about Biden's strategy is based one way to put it would be should he act more like FDR here or should he act more like you know Jimmy Carter? Should he should he, should he be a a kind of calm let's all bring the people together or should he be a happy warrior like FDR? Um, in yeah. The, yeah. So, okay, so we, we look at yeah. the 1930s for the same reason we look at each of the other periods, because it was a time when uh, um, many Americans were worried that democracy was going to disintegrate. Um, but it's different than the other cases in that um, while there's a lot of threat around that that could happen, you know, people are... Um, they're looking across at Europe, they're seeing the rise of autocratic leaders in Europe, and then they're seeing an American president who, you know, coming in to govern in the midst of the Great Depression is using new powers that previous presidents have not. And so there were many Americans who were afraid that democracy was going to deteriorate and that Roosevelt would become an autocrat. But it's really the case for the most part of the dog that doesn't bark because um, FDR manages to expand executive powers, but to use them in a way that in the main, for the most part, he's trying to respond to what the public wants for uh, economic security and well being and so on. Um, now, it's really interesting. Um, during that point in time, I mean, besides the people who were afraid he was going to become an autocrat, there were actually Americans encouraging him to become an autocrat, including the liberal columnist Walter Lippmann, for example. I mean, it's really fascinating how, if you think of like the roads not taken in the 1930s, the United States could have come out of that in a very different direction. And, um, and we think Roosevelt, you know, he did exercise restraint. Um, and with the exceptions of, you know, Japanese internment, yep. for example, and now we're moving to the 1940s, and uh, the growth of the national security state and it being used for surveillance of American citizens with wiretapping, et cetera, during World War II. Um, those kinds of, of powers, um, those national security powers and some of the other like enlargement of executive branch powers, um, are left there to be used by later presidents, um, and they can use them in ways that are responding to, you know, the public's needs and wants, or they can use them for their own personal and political gain. And so once you get down the road to Richard Nixon, he's using those executive powers in the latter way. So this malevolent use of the executive power that, you know, really begins to grow under FDR. So, so that, that's how we see it. Great, thank you. That's actually clarifying for me too. Um, maybe one, we've got a lot of good questions coming at us from the chat, but I want to ask one more and it, it, it um, well, I just want to ask one more, um, which is how, how, it's a little bit about your, your own positioning. Um, you, you emphasize that, and, and Robert just said it a couple minutes ago, that one of the pillars of democracy is uh, recognizing the legitimacy of the other party. And, um, and, and, and so not questioning the basic, uh, the ba the basic um, right of the other party to operate the way it wants to within our political system, um, in in the uh, especially in the eighteen hundred chapter, you have all these powerful quotes from very distinguished American founders denouncing each other, um, and doing so I, I suspect sincerely, right? Even if they were misplaced, um, but basically Republicans saying that Federalists are are completely uh, evil, and Federalists saying Republicans are completely evil. So then you say, you know, today you, one party has led the way in exacerbating several of the four threats, guess which one? The Republican Party has abandoned its willingness to protect the pillars of democracy. The Democratic Party today is faced with the obligation of defending democracy itself. So I just wanna ask the obvious question, I'm sure you have a great answer to it, but why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing the hyperpartisanship there? Why aren't you like, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson denouncing the Federalists in 1800, for example? Yeah, I mean, you know, it is, um, it's, it's a very, it's very hard to, to try and analyze this kind of situation with a little bit of uh, reserve and detachment, although right. uh, we tried hard to do that. Um, but, you know, this is, you know, hyperpartisanship is not an exaggeration to describe the, the current situation, you know, um, uh, and, you um, know, 
you know, what's interesting about this, though, is that this is not just, you know, the, the, one of the things that distinguishes, I think, the contemporary situation from the 1790s is that was primarily uh, uh, an elite controversy. It was, you know, Jefferson and Hamilton calling each other names in their, in their own party newspapers. Um, although it did some, to some extent filter out to the broader public. I mean, we have stories about um, Federalists and Republicans holding competing Fourth of July celebrations in the 1790s um, um, and that sort of thing. Um, the situation today is that plus this deep um, social and political sorting of ordinary Americans, like mm -hmm. we've, w w that's, that's um, really, I think, unprecedented, or we, the, the, that we don't have a record of in previous eras. Um, so, you know, I just, when we, I was talking about polarization earlier, I described a common view of American society as having these overlapping or cross-cutting cleavages, that people belong to a variety of different groups, um, and they sort of move in and out of different affiliations, depending on, you know, who you go to school with or work with or go to church with or bowl with or what have you. Increasingly, those lines are, those groups are aligning so that the people that we live with and or live near and go to school with and work with and go to church with and, and, and so on um, are, are increasingly similar. Um, and so partisanship becomes like a sort of social identity. Um, there's one revealing piece of data that we cite in the book um, that you may have seen, other people may have seen before, and that is there was a survey question that was asked a number of times in the 1960s um, that said, um, would you be upset if your son or daughter married someone of the opposite political party? Um, you know, the way my grandmother would have been upset at, at, you know, marrying outside the faith, you know. And most people 50 years ago said, no, it wouldn't bother me. That would be fine if my son or daughter brought home someone of the other party. When that question was asked again a few years ago, a majority of people said, yes, I would be upset if my, uh, if my child brought home someone from the opposite political party. Um, and that suggests that that partisanship has become a part, for many Americans, a part of their uh, makeup. And that's what makes this so hard. So yeah, even though there is one party that's sort of leading the charge against, um, against the pillars of democracy, the party, the Republican Party has been in power more or less for the last few years, um, and, but for, for a long time has been on this slow move uh, to sort of undermine a lot of the features of, of modern democracy. Um, you know, this situation where not just elites, office holders, but uh, the public are so deeply polarized um, makes it very hard to imagine uh, ourselves into a situation where we don't end up in this, this kind of conflict. Yeah. I want to jump in on that if I could for a moment too. Okay. Um, uh, I think, you know, we, um, as we were writing the book, we kind of um, kept ourselves open to the idea that maybe both parties today were responsible for harm to democracy. After all, you know, polarization is a, it's a two-way street, it's dynamic, and you can find ways in which both the contemporary Republican and Democratic Party have, have led to it becoming heightened. But when we come down to looking at the four pillars of democracy that Rob laid out earlier, mm -hmm. and where the harm has been, um, the erosion that has been happening over the last few years, we see it happening from the Republican Party. The way we understand it is that the Republican Party is now in this position where it wants to pursue its own power and its own goals at all costs, never mind democracy. And I mean, this is like what the South did in the 1850s, ultimately, um, in the story we tell of what was happening in the 1850s, um, where you know ultimately the South, which had been managing to kind of go along with democracy in terms of you know, having elections, representative government, as long as it could keep slavery. But then once it was beginning to lose at the ballot box on slavery and it saw its political power receding, it had to choose between slavery and democracy and it chose to protect slavery and you know, secedes from the union and goes to war. And so it's when a party is pursuing its goals at all costs, never mind democracy, that that's when it's dangerous. And then the dilemma is, what should the opposition party do? 
Um, and this is really challenging. I mean, I think that's what you're asking. And there are scholars of comparative politics who really study this. And so, you know, one possibility is they try to find ways to work together with the other party. And I thought when Trump first got elected that some of this might happen. Um, and I think that Nancy Pelosi was, you know, trying to look for some opportunities along those lines, like, um, you know, for some policy making around infrastructure or something that did not come to pass. Um, so then you're left with a couple of other choices. One is for um, the opposition party to moderate. Um, some would argue that the Democratic Party, by putting forth Joe Biden as its candidate, is trying to take a middle course, not so much even in terms of policies, but the fact that, you know, there's a white male candidate who's gone forward um, uh, who's as, as the Democratic nominee. But the third one is to use institutional levers to try to um, go after the party that is being egregious and is violating the norms of democracy. And that's certainly what, you know, impeachment is the biggest example of that. But it's a challenge for the opposition party because it's got to um, walk this fine line of not violating democracy itself, but trying to right the ship and trying to restore um, the pillars. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, so we have we have a couple questions that are I'm going to lump together because they're really about um, they're asking you to react to these um, high profile news stories uh, that seem to be uh, new in our in our era. So one of them um, one of them is mis misinformation and fake news, and the other one is foreign interference. Uh, so if you if you're just looking at the general coverage of this election, those would be very prominent themes. But your book, by being historical, doesn't highlight those as much. So our I mean, I guess one way to put it is do we have do we have actually a fifth and sixth threat that we haven't seen before? Uh, or are these do you um, understand them in, in the in a con in a historical context? So misinformation and um, foreign influence. Yeah, I that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, and there there's there's no question that those are both um, serious concerns right now. Um, I think there's you know, there's some historical precedent for these things. Certainly information is a tool or a weapon that polarizers have been able to access and use throughout American history. Um, the 1790s, for example, is a great example of that. You know, you had these two not quite political parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, right. um, each with its own newspaper. There was a, the Federalists had an essentially officially government newspaper that became their party organ. And so the Republicans uh, decided, well, we need our own newspaper. Um, and so you had these competing newspapers um, that would present the world according to the, either the Federalists or the Republicans to their supporters. Um, and, um, and, and also, you know, as, as, as we've alluded to already, you know, uh, called each other h horrible names. You know, this was very personal, very direct. Um, uh, very conflictual language that was used in these channels. So, so the idea of using information channels um, for uh, uh, to present one-sided versions of events mm -hmm. or to call the other side names <laughs> is not new. It may be accelerated um, and and strengthened by you know modern media tools, um, social media, cable news, you know. Um, but but we're, we're essentially replicating an old kind of situation with these you know Fox News and MSNBC or uh, Twitter and Facebook, which allow people to receive very targeted uh, messages. So so you know what may be new is the is the speed, the rapidity, the ease of mm -hmm. um, pushing this information out and and sort of carefully defining groups to receive different versions of, of the world. Um, but, but information and misinformation have been a part of these episodes uh, before. Um, and even foreign influence, you know, a lot of the conflict in the 1790s again was over whether or not the United States should get involved in these wars between Britain and France. Um, and each and, side and accused that, the other of, you know, being under the thumb of one of these one or the other of these powers, right? So the Federalists claimed that the Republicans were just, you know, sort of dupes for revolutionary France um, and vice versa. 
So, um, and an so, actual French agent going up and down the uh, seaboard trying to drum up exactly, right? exactly. So, right. so even right. that is not yeah. even that's not a new phenomenon. Yeah, I think I'm playing in my own mind with the idea that you guys have the right four threats and that these are just modes of, of uh, things like misinformation are just modes of the way the way the threat actually gets gets implemented. We've got some more good questions. I want to make sure we don't run out of time for the one that I care about the most and that my friend Cheryl Gravy, who's worked in um, League of Women Voters and other places in the civics, in the civic infrastructure of America poses, which is what can average Americans who are concerned about this do in addition to voting to help our democracy along the path forward? And I mean, it's a, it's a fair question for you guys because you must have written it with some average Americans in mind. That is, you want people to read the book, right? I mean, it's a very accessible, um, scholarly grounding, but very readable book. You must want people to read it and do something or think about doing something. So any guidance for what we should, what we should do? Yeah. Um, I think that the first thing I would say is um, I, I push back on sort of, um, you know, putting voting aside, saying besides voting, what mm -hmm. can we do? I mean, the mm -hmm. main thing we can do is vote. Um, you know, in terms of like these four threats that we've laid out, um, people will say, well, you know, how can we um, rein them back in? That's really hard to do. And that's, uh, you know, that's a long run goal. But um, I think that, you know, more in the short term, what we need to do is to, first of all, practice um, good citizenship. And, um, and voting is the most important thing and, and trying to um, support this election in any way we can. I mean, I'm, I'm planning to be a, a poll worker. I think there's you know, a lot of concern about not having enough poll workers because the older people usually do those jobs and they're, they're worried about coming out in a pandemic. Um, and I think, um, you know, I mean, I do hope that we're going to get to a point in time where um, before long in this country where mail-in voting is just very easy and well accepted and, and uh, by everyone. Um, we're not there right now. So I, I kind of think that if, if people feel like it is okay for them to vote in person, that that's probably a good thing to do this time around. Um, if it seems safe in the area where you live. Um, if we're, you know, if it feels safe to be grocery shopping, it should be safe to be, um, to be voting in person. Um, mm -hmm. But then, um, you know, besides that, I do think that, um, we need to, as a society, to find ways, and this is obviously a, a longer term goal, to, to bridge these divides that are growing where we're becoming so sorted into our, you know, um, our different corners of uh, the political, political community and society with all these, you know, overlapping measure um, uh, memberships, but not ones that cross um, each other. And so we need to find ways to do that. Um, and uh, I think that's a longer term goal. Yeah, your book doesn't talk a lot about the, um, the kind of tradition of, which I think of de Tocqueville, but I think of Dewey and lots of people who think that the political institutions rest on ordinary everyday behavior um, and that we can work on that. So things like dialogue across difference in our regular communities or participation in associations and that some of our deficits are there. I, I actually would want to add a, another threat, which would be the decline of ordinary associational life in the second, in the last part of the 20th century. Um, so I don't know if we're, we're, we're going to run out of time soon. So I'm, I'm now injecting my own opinions, but any, any thoughts about that, that kind of line of argument? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think um, it's not a core part of our framework, that kind of civic uh, or associational life or, or social movements, uh, for example, although a lot of our, our periods are characterized by extensive social movement activity. Um, I think if we had written about um, the more democratizing moments in American history, the re Reconstruction and the Second Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Era, um, that kind of um, that kind of activity would have maybe had a more prominent role, but I agree. And I think that's one of the things um, to connect that to the previous question. I think that's one of the things that we can do, that people can do and that we can look to um, in a couple of senses. One is um, um, that I think, you know, we, we think about the, the parties and political conflict as being very regional. Um, um, you know, sort of the coasts against the middle, cities against rural uh, America. Um, but I think we have to remember that, you know, this is, a, this is a big, complicated, federated country, and we shouldn't write any 
part of the country off in, as, a, as, a, as a support for this kind of democratic engagement. Um, work by um, our friend and teacher, Thea Scotchpole and Laura Putnam has shown the possibility for, um, for really intensive political organizing, even in unlikely places in rural Pennsylvania, say, in, in the last few years. Um, so we shouldn't write any part of the country off, um, and everyone everywhere should be worried about this. Um, the, other, the other thing I'd say is if there's one thing that's happened this spring and summer that maybe gives me a little bit of hope, it's the extent and depth and breadth of the Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. protests. Um, you know, as we've said earlier in the conversation, you know, that sort of the racial challenge of building a true multiracial inclusive democracy has been the thing that's bedeviled American democracy more than anything else through its history. And if you look at the places that these protests are happening and the breadth of the kinds of people who are participating, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, maybe this is a little bit of evidence that we're starting a new reckoning with this, this um, problem in our history. Um, there's a lot to happen between here and there. There's a lot of conflict and a lot of politics and a lot of activity and a lot of movements and a lot of protest um, that still has to take place. But maybe there's a ray of hope there. Maybe, maybe that's great. And I'm, I'm actually supposed to wind this up because this is the amount of time that we allotted. But maybe that's also an appropriate place to end. It strikes me you, you two are the Paul Revere's of, of the moment. You're kind of um, raising the alarm. And in order to do that, you've picked out the moments in American history that are most perilous. And I learned a lot, um, even though I think I, I mean, I watched the musical and I thought I knew the history, but actually there's all, <laughs> Hamilton behaves very badly in, in, this, in their book. Um, but, but no, but I mean, the point of picking out these moments is to wake everybody up and realize that we're in uh, really serious danger because it's not an unprecedented situation, but rather we have lucked out on a bunch of occasions and, and made other people pay the price for those um, successes. So that's a um, powerful book. There, there could be a kind of counter book, which would be about the moments when we've actually built a better society. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't want to be Pollyanna, but um, there have been those moments. And maybe maybe that's the place, alluding to those moments is a good place to end. So um, I want to just uh, mainly um, thank uh, Rob and Suzanne. Um, I could go on actually for another hour or two, but that's not my job. So, but thank you so much for joining me. That was really fun, at least for me. Um, and I also want to thank everybody for joining us on out there in the um, in the in the web and uh, uh, and for your good questions which we didn't get to entirely um, and to invite everybody to join um, SNF Agora again next Friday for Trump versus Biden versus media and manipulation um, which will probably more explicitly address some of these issues about um, misinformation moderated by former New York Times reporter Scott Shane um, and the focus will be on how voters can sort fact from fiction and make informed choices leading up to the election. And you can find out more information about that, including, oh, a, a link to this, um, to this webcast, a recording of this webcast, and uh, information about the future ones at snfagora.jhu.edu. And I hope to see everybody next week. And thanks again. Thank you. Really enjoyed it.